Glenn Horowitz is one of the top brokers of cultural archives and rare books in the United States. A 1977 graduate of Bennington College, he opened his eponymous firm in 1980 and since then has placed with collectors and institutions nationwide the works and papers of a diverse array of authors, artists, photographers, and historical figures from James Joyce, Tom Wolfe, Vladimir Nabokov, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt, to Lenny Bruce, R. Buckminster Fuller, Timothy Leary, and Bob Dylan, to name just a few. In addition, he has collaborated with the development of discrete collections including a preeminent feminist research archive and published over 70 books and catalogs. Welcome to the Bibliophile. It's a pleasure to be here. You're known for your inventive packaging. How do you package authors, papers? Well, generally, we just pile them in boxes. I mean, that's, a <laughs> <laughs> it's really, that's kind of generous of you to say it. I don't know that we package them imaginatively as, as much as what I think I think I was fortunate enough to understand at an early moment in, in, in the evolution of my life as a, as a bookseller was that the interest in the papers of initially literary figures, the historical practicing artists, was was going to grow as the, the, the uh, size of research institutions continued to mature. That, that books somehow definitionally uh, had had some had a ceiling on it, and 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 if, in fact, um, there were nine major American institutions that had large Robert Frost collections, there probably wasn't going to be a tenth. However, if one had the papers of uh, a poet of the stature of Lewis Merwin or James Merrill or Phil Levine, I mean, th- this was another way for institutions to to sort of extend the brand of their own scholarship. I think that was the insight I had. I was then helped along. I think. Sorry. So, in other words, if if an institution has an important poet, if you came along with with someone else who was connected to that poet, it's an obvious fit. I think that's true, though. Um, I never actually that's just an interesting way to frame. It. I, I never really thought of caboosing collections um, like collections uh, with one with 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 one another. Uh, my sense was to identify institutions that would have uh, a natural sympathy uh, from a research perspective or a pedagogical perspective with the work of a particular uh, figure. Mm -hmm. Um, I think what I was saying a moment ago uh, that helped me along and I was really at the right uh, place at the right moment was uh, the speed with which technology came online and no pun intended, and, and, and began to uh, almost transform the utility of these collections in large institutions. So the, the model that existed for many years of an institution buying a collection of letters and papers and then making them available to people who would uh, transport themselves to the physical space yeah. um, began to evaporate very quickly. And you could almost trace it through. But you have to go there to smell it and touch it. Well, I mean, th- that, 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 that's a genuinely profound sentiment that you're articulating, whether it is sentimental or it is practical, there may, mm-hmm. be, there may be a middle distance. Uh, I think that people of our age you know, are some form of, of uh, hybrid in that our experience of texts and books predate in internet age um, and yet we you know, are able to avail ourselves of, of, of the benefits and the pleasures of, of, of the internet. But the generations that have now come of age and are coming of age, I mean, they, they don't have the same life experience. They've come of age in the internet world. They, they have, but yeah. I might disagree with that because there's a boom in letterpress printing right now, for example, be- just ver- just because of the very nature of the internet and the fact that it isn't tactile. I find what you say to be poignant. I'm not persuaded, and I, I don't know that it isn't a gasp in some ways that is driven to a large extent by, by a nostalgia that many of us um, experience. Mm-hmm. I, I, I simply don't see it you know, on, on a regular basis, and, and those people I know who are in their 50s and 60s and 70s who are 
were born into that tradition of, of bookmaking and letterpress printing. Um, I, I just don't see any uh, substantial group of, of, of protégés coming along. But you know, it's, it's also it, I, I said to somebody uh, over lunch today, coincidentally, you know, when, when when the last person left standing, there'll still be a book somewhere in the world because um, you know, that is what you know, the, the book was was intended to do was to survive. But where I see the major change taking place, um, and it has a direct influence and and impact on on the work I do, is that um, the amount of material that we're encountering that is born digital to the stage as distinct from analog and, and uh, committed to paper is shifting dramatically. And, and so the archives that we've worked on in recent memory of literary figures, yeah. specifically literary figures, uh, say from the age of 50 to 70, Jonathan Lethem, Mary Carr, Jeff Eugenides, I mean, people of you know, substantial literary uh, merit. Um, there's there's a, a, a blend of text shadows that exist on paper and on the screen at the same time. And so, I, so they've saved their emails, I assume. They've saved their emails. They've saved multiple drafts of their books that they committed to the screen. In, in some instances, these are people who also came of age prior to the Internet. So they, they do keep journals. They do keep diaries. They do print out versions of their texts and correct them. Um, but it's also clear to me, looking at productive, prolific writers, whether they want to say this aloud or not, the internet is, I mean, the, the, the screen is a great tool for them. Oh, yeah. The amount of work Time that they saver, can get yeah. done, mm-hmm. the amount of uh, draft material they can preserve to go back to is just, it, you just can't compare it to, uh, you know, to the, uh, the notebooks similar to the one that you have in front of you right now. Perhaps we could get to, uh, to your inventive, uh, maybe packaging is a bit pejorative, it's not meant to be. But, oh, I, uh, I didn't take it personally. <laughs> Um, but Bob Dylan, the, 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 arg- the, the I think one of the key arguments that you made in placing his, his work is that you're going to get your money back because thousands of Bob Dylan fans are going to pour into your city. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know that I framed it quite as equationally as that, though. <laughs> though, though um, no, much yeah, more subtly, yeah, no, I'm no, sure. Right. Um, I mean, what, what was clear to me was that the group with whom... I did the Bob Dylan deal, I mean, who engaged in the transaction with us, was a group that I had met prior to that over the transaction for Woody Guthrie's archive. Yeah, and which you which you also yes, which I was also yeah. involved with, and, mm-hmm. and and I and I could see because they're they're they're, they're wonderfully uh, they're, they're, they're visionaries that um, though the the overwhelming majority of the the, the, the the philanthropy that they do is is really directed at. At, at disenfranchised people, uh, but it's, uh, and it's also Tulsa, right? It's Tulsa, Tulsa is yeah, very important to them. Tulsa is very important, and, and the transformation or the reclamation of Tulsa to the folks at the Kaiser Foundation is, is essential to the vision they have, and, and their, their acquisition of the uh, Guthrie Papers, which resulted in the building of a Guthrie Center in the uh, in the uh, Arts District, which which they were. Uh, and are in the process of, of uh, rehabilitating in, in a very substantial and, and moving manner, well, was an anchor for that district and, and the transformation they were envisioning. What they didn't calculate uh, fully was that uh, Woody, having really uh, uh, ceased his creative life in 1950 when, when he went into hospital and, and uh, expired you know, under very difficult circumstances over the next six, seven years, was a figure that was was not not remote, but but didn't resonate uh, for contemporary audiences with, uh, let's say, some of the the power that it did to the group around the Kaiser Foundation. You know, uh, who, who knew full well you know the, the dimensions of Woody as a as both an artist and as a, as a first son of Oklahoma. So when when the opportunity uh, presented itself to to work with. Uh, Mr. Dillon and the people around him on his archive, the thought crossed my mind that if they really were in earnest about using this type of archival DNA to undertake this transformation in Tulsa, uh, you know, this, this civic transformation, that, that Dillon would be a more likely candidate to help them achieve the kind of, uh, how would you say, uh, Body mass that they were searching for in terms of visitors, because and Dylan, that, of course, was a, a huge. Country. Well, Bob, yeah, Bob Dylan, inscrutable as he is, you know, remains one of the. It seems to me the, uh, the, the fountainhead of of a certain uh, generational outlook. 
I also was very lucky because I assure you that I had uh, very little to do with the award of Bob's Nobel Prize. <laughs> um, but the prize came uh, shortly after the transaction was completed. Uh, okay. So it, it, did, it did, you know, uh, lend a certain maybe, how would you say, prescience <laughs> to, uh, to the approach that I took. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was, very, it, was, it was fortunate. And um, there mm -hmm. are a couple of other projects that we're working on with the same group that revolve around American music from that period that I think could be sort of the, uh, the last layer yeah. In, this, in this project, so it's, it's been very exciting. You know, to say it was imaginative would be, I think, to heap you know a couple of tablespoons of praise on me that, that I don't merit. But did you have to make? But did you have to push the sale, or was it? Did, did it just happen? Well, let me. I, I, I don't think I don't think that pushing a sale and it just happening are necessarily you know, oxymoronic. <laughs> um, I nudged, or nudged might be the better way to say. It. I nudged. <laughs> The sale, and then it took on a life. You packaged it beautifully, right, you, 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 uniquely uh, Dylan-esque. I mean, uh, yeah. and Bob is somebody that uh, you know, people want to be involved with. In that, in that sense, we got very lucky. Okay. I mean, there are transactions that I would accept the charge of packaging. I think the one that yeah. probably has, in many ways, the most resonance for me, and and and, and many uh, very valuable friendships uh, derived from it, and and I and I learned a great deal about how to approach uh, certain types of archival projects. Was the deal that I put together a number of years ago for Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein over the Watergate, their Watergate collection, their Which journals, are, they're, well, they're, 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 they're reporters' notebooks, yeah. the, the, the the endless uh, um, typescripts of the stories that ran to the post, all the other material that they accumulated in the process of the years they worked on the Watergate project. And that, that we did that transaction with the University of Texas. I did it, and they, they were the only people with whom we spoke, and I didn't know at the time that the then president of the university, uh, a wonderfully uh, uh, steady and sturdy man named Larry Faulkner, perceived, long before I offered Texas the uh, Woodward and Bernstein collection, Watergate as, as the central political event of, of his of his maturation. It had changed the relationship of citizens you know, to the government. So when I showed up at Texas with this collection, uh, it went immediately to the president's office. There was still something uh, a bit more incendiary about Watergate then than now. I mean, Although it resonates. Well, no, it resonates very loudly now, it does. But what I was able to do by lacing Woodward and Bernstein into the life of the University of Texas. Uh, with them came a lot of the folks at the Washington Post. We would eventually do a deal for Ben Bradley, and his papers ended up uh, at the University of Texas. And really, but on sorry, the back sorry. of this archive, the University of Texas uh, was able to end up owning the academic freeway that is Watergate, Nixon, the imperial presidency. Um, and it became university-wide. You've mentioned the fact that it had an impact on the president of the university's mm -hmm. life. But what else, what other connections did you imaginatively put together? At the University of Texas? Yeah. Well, I, I thought that if I could take to this you know, huge American institution that you know, quite appropriately sees itself on the cutting edge of a certain type of contemporary scholarship, that has a great law school, that has a great American studies program, that has a school of journalism. And has deep, deep pockets. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't really thought of it in those terms, but you were right when you say that that if I had taken a deal of that size, that was a $5 million transaction, if I had taken it to you know, the University of Mississippi, uh, it, it probably would have met with an enthusiastic blank stare. Um, but the University of Texas saw the multiple opportunities that it presented. Um, it was also, you know, <laughs> it, was, it was on their part one of the more creative uh, funding undertakings that I have ever encountered, which is to say it was crucial to Mr. Woodward that, that no uh, state-sponsored dollars were used for the acquisition of this collection and that all of the money that would be spent on it had to be raised by patrons, through patrons of the university. And he even asked the president, Larry Faulkner, uh, who he grew quite close to and admiring of, that he, Faulkner, uh, as he raised the money, tried to balance contributions between Republicans and Democrats. Why didn't he want state contributions? Well, I mean, he, he didn't because you know, Texas is a, if not a state-funded institution, though to some extent it's, it's state-mandated, and I think the last thing he wanted to hear were uh, legislators 
uh, from from oh. Waco and Laredo standing up debating the merits <laughs> right, of the university, right, yeah, you know, yeah. buying the papers of two reporters who brought a Republican president to heal. Yeah, and th th so so his notion was that if he could if it could be done through private uh, contributions and it could be balanced uh, between yeah. partisans of each party, it would offer a clean exit ramp. Uh, for him in terms of, of being able to uh, let this material go into the world. Okay. One of the key <coughs> sort of uh, interests in uh, an author's archive is to show the creative process. And I just wonder why is it so important to everyone to see this creative process? It's, you know, you've got the finished product, which is, which is the work of art, which mm -hmm. is great. Why are they spending all this money on these drafts? Mm -hmm. What does it show them? Well, I mean, the you know, you, 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 you're touching on a um, you know a subject that I think is probably um, how would you say probably uh, a reflection of uh, certain types of generational scholarship that have been undertaken in the twentieth century. The, I, I think the the, the uh, energy uh, that was unleashed right after the war in literary criticism by the circle of critics referred to as the new critics mm -hmm. um, placed a primacy on the text yeah. um, and a very close reading of the text and it became and as, here as, here it, to that that's right and, and, and it became it became the the, uh, the sort of central uh, focus of, of, of a certain type of, of not certain time, but of, of, of the primary strain of, of uh, literary uh, criticism and, and history. If if that is true, then the stamina that 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 you know, exists that precedes the finished text began to take on for scholars, you know, a very profound and appetizing appeal. What is interesting is that as the world continues to change, and identity politics have taken over. Uh, a certain amount of academic impulses. The interest in uh, pure textual studies has begun to melt. And the interest in uh, the apparatus that surrounds the profession of authorship uh, has become much more uh, mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. And where 10 or 12 years ago, um, the sale of, of the archive of a you know, gifted... Uh, successful writer was 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 the um, uh, attack plan that we would, we would come up with. Um, mm -hmm. When we look at archives right now, we're, we're always searching for the sort of ancillary material, correspondence, diaries, journals, uh, that will open the window beyond the uh, interest in, in the primary texts. Right. And I think it's fair to say that, that, that the uh, centrality of the uh, individual as the uh, pr uh, progenitor of of, uh, of 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 a body of texts ha has has begun to to melt in a very serious way, as is reflected, it seems to me, in how uh, the dialogue, the cultural dialogue, is is slowly but inexorably removing the book as a uh, as a central document from from the world in which we live. I mean, it's to the dismay of people of our generation, yes. but, but it's certainly there. Well, and it's it's wonderful, really, for you because all of these different ways of looking at text now give you all sorts of new uh, arguments in favor of uh, of that institution acquiring it. I think that's well. I think that's very well said. That really is. Um, how long that will go on, and what the next trends, next iteration, or next evolutionary iteration will be. Um, I think is is uh, is a great challenge. You studied fiction under Bernard Malamud. I did indeed. I did indeed. You what was it. that like? Um, Mr. Malamud had a. a were, you a were you a top student or? A well, at, at Bennington, they, they they didn't do a great deal of how would you say grading and calibrating of uh, <laughs> of at least hierarchically. Okay. Um, were you a teacher's pet? I had I had the highest regard for him. Um, he was an intimidating. Personality, uh, remarkably disciplined, uh, dry, focused, and I thought really uh, in the four years that I spent at his um, at his knee as a student that that he was uh, 
he was unsure what he thought of me, both as a, as a, uh, uh, a student and as a, as a person. However, um, after I graduated, another probably indication of, of the precision with which he held himself, a legitimate friendship evolved, uh, so much so that um, in his last years when he, he was suffering from the effects of a stroke that he never recovered from, uh, he, he laced me into his, uh, his will as the person that uh, the family should come to uh, when the time was appropriate to, um, to, to help uh, with the arrangements for, for the estate. It was mm. doubly valuable because, it, I mean, the poignancy was great and it introduced me to um, his lifetime editor and friend Bob Giroux, who then went on to become a very dear friend at the same time. So it was a, it was, it was, it was a, uh, to say it was a meaningful relationship would uh, be to exaggerate. He uh, very much had a uh, powerful influence in me. And interestingly, I think the, the lesson I took from him uh, really had to do with attention to detail, persistence in pursuing, you know, a vision as difficult as it might be. Um, and a, a work ethos that I think has served me very well over the years. You went on to work at one of my favorite places in the whole world, which is uh, the third floor of uh, the Strand bookstore. I would like to say that um, I could affirm that, but when, when I was working at the Strand bookstore in, from October of uh, 79 until um, October of I'm sorry, October of 77 to October of 79, when, when, I, when I started my business, it somehow um, has been written to the record. We, I started in January of 1988, I guess, just to uh, round it off. Okay. Um, but we, uh, I was working at the Strand on the fifth floor, not the third floor, which was where they had their original uh, rare book departments. Okay, uh, it was rare books, though. It, it, was, it, yeah. was, it was the big... I mean, to, to call them uh, rare books would be something of a... Well, that's uh, the nice thing, though. Some of them are, you know, you're, it gives you a chance as a purchaser. You can find some interesting stuff there that's not overpriced, certainly. Sometimes it's mm -hmm. underpriced. Mm -hmm. At least that's been my experience. No, no. And, and, and when we started, it really was, it was, it was very soon uh, before I commenced working at the Strand that they opened up this, 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 this new department dedicated to, uh, to rare books. And you could, in those days... If you were a buyer of first editions or rare books, you could get tremendous bargains because what we really were doing was filtering out the more interesting books from these large libraries that were being purchased and moving them from the main floor where they would just literally just disappear up to you know, the rare books department mm -hmm. um, and pricing them at uh, what we knew to be you know, a uh, modest percentage of what the market might actually bear. Mm -hmm. So for private collectors, a handful of whom... Uh, blessedly became friends and, and, and would, would, would sort of follow me uptown when I started my business. You know, it really was a very happy hunting ground at the time. Mm -hmm. Fred uh, Bass died recently. Uh, maybe you could uh, say a word or two about him. Um, I went back just far enough at the Strand that when I was hired, I was hired by Fred's father, Ben Bass, oh, okay. <coughs> who, who started the Strand. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that Mr. Bass was sympathetic to me and hired me and, and was willing to give me this, uh, <laughs> this, this uh, unusual and unorthodox position working in you know, this one or two person rare books department, knowing full well that you know, at, at 22, I mean, there was virtually nothing that I knew uh, because I had a great uncle who had been a colleague of Ben's back in the 30s and 40s, and owned a used bookstore on 4th Avenue when 4th Avenue was, uh, was uh, uh, referred to as Booksellers Row. And my uncle's name was Haskell Hockey Kruberger, and he had a shop called the Humanities Bookstore. Mm. Uh, coincidentally, despite that, and, and, and it was uh, my, my uncle who sent me to see Mr. Bass, who gave me the job, uh, by the time I came of age, I was raised uh, two hours north of New York City, my uncle had sold his book business and moved up to the Berkshires and was running a small used bookstore. So that experience never really penetrated my consciousness, except to the extent that, that it was my uncle who said, you know, while you're trying to figure out what you're going to do with your life, you know, you'll have fun, go work in your bookstore and go see my friend Ben Bass, mm. which indeed is what happened. I mean, that's, that's how I, you know, entered the book trade. Yeah. Your father helped you out by lending you some money to, what, buy a, an archive that you turned around and sold? No, 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 no. My, my father, a, a kind and, and 
a generous man, liked by all. Much better liked, I think, than, than I. <laughs> um, yeah, why aren't you liked? No, no, I'm. I'm, I'm You're liked. I'm. I'm. I, my, my daughters adore me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that. I don't know that I'm. Just like I, I do think that because of the of the size of many of the transactions yeah. that we have worked on and the amount of attention they've received. Well, I, Dylan I, was twenty million dollars. I, 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 At least that's you, what's been reported. That, that that appeared in the press somewhere. Yeah, uh, the Times reported it as uh, between fifteen and twenty million dollars, if I recollect correctly. You know, I I've generated, I think, uh, inadvertently, uh, a certain how might you say uh, envy on yeah. the part of the yeah. people, and yeah. envy, envy can sometimes, as as one knows. Uh, evolve into frustration or, or discord. Yeah. But I would go so far as to say you could find uh, a dozen or 15 fellow tradesmen who would uh, speak very highly of me. And I've tried to be generous and, and open to younger dealers throughout my uh, my career. It, but there, there was a one time, I remember there was a fellow up in Seattle who used to write a blog and um, he seemed every third day to write about me and, and um, you know, uh, cast a terrible, uh, well, not, I guess at all, Spurgeon uh, Terrell, but, but cast, you know, uh, yeah. you know very, very pointed comments in my direction. He has inflated prices, which does a disservice to scholarship. Strong markets mean people don't donate so often. Yeah, that was a quote, I think, from the then, I guess he still is, I think, the curator of rare books at the Fales Library at NYU. In a profile that the uh, New York Times Book Review did a number of years ago, a four-page profile, looked like a Bibliophilic centerfold. He's very unorthodox, <laughs> and, and uh, I think his name is, is Marvin Taylor. Um, uh, attacked me for somehow undermining the uh, uh, eff- efficacy of, of writers donating their papers to institutions, rather than God forbid, uh, turn around in the later years of their life and actually earn some money for their life's work. So I, I, I guess it just depends on which side of the uh, the ping pong table you're standing on. Yeah, but on the other hand, like it, it's smaller institutions that don't have any money, it's just like they can't, you know, they can't buy anything anymore. Well, smaller institutions that don't have money are not built, very frankly, to be research centers. Mm-hmm. Smaller institutions don't have the. I mean, what, what, one of the one of the uh, potential realities that may uh, save the collections that exist in smaller institutions from being dispersed is the presence of the internet and the ability to take these collections and, and make them available to, yeah. to other users. But uh, the notion that somehow you know, every small institution should somehow be uh, a repository for certain types of scholarly uh, material is, is, seems to be, you know, if not quaint, then certainly um, a little bit weak-minded at a certain point. I know you're doing scholarship a favor by having one or two archives sitting in a small school in Iowa when, in fact, you know, the concentration of really uh, significant material is in uh, major institutions that have the infrastructure mm-hmm. to make this material available to scholars. I'm Canadian, so I need to slip in a little bit of Canadian content here. I don't have to, but I, I want to. Um, you can make fun of Americans. Go ahead. Well, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to ask about Michael Ondaatje. Mm-hmm. Did do you handle his work? I, 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 I want it very much. I'm a huge admirer of, uh, of Mr. Ondaatje's work. And uh, sadly for me, I spoke to, to, to Michael just within days, it seemed, of his having agreed to permit a, uh, a lovely bookseller that I've known for 35 years named Ken Lopez ah, in yes. Hadley, Massachusetts, yeah. uh, to handle his work. And, um, and from what I can tell, I think Ken did a splendid job for, for Mr. Ndache. Yeah, that's unfortunate. I wish you had because I wanted to get the backstory on it, largely because it, there was not a peep out of anyone in Canada about the fact that this important Canadian writer's archive. Now, I, you've just made the argument for sending important no, archives I, I, to... I, I, I would, uh, how would you say properly? I, I, I could see it from both perspectives. I mean, uh, Canada has you know, a handful of really, really, really fine uh, research libraries, and the folks at the University of Toronto and at McGill, uh, McMaster, I mean, they have no reason uh, you know, to feel you know, any shyness in, in promoting themselves as, as major you know, international centers of, of research. 
Well, I, 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 did, I, they, I, did they apply, like did they go after it? Did I, anyone I, go after I, it? I, I don't have any details. I, I okay. will. I will. Talking slightly out of school, say that I have had a very happy friendship over the last dozen years with Margaret Atwood, mm -hmm. um, and we have worked on some genuinely interesting projects together. But Margaret uh, schooled me very quickly when the subject arose in some of the how might you say some of the peculiarities and, and unique uh, predilections of uh, Canadians, which suggested to her that under no circumstance was she going to engage in a public transaction and watch her papers go from Canada to an American institution and entered into uh, what I, I hope is a happy relationship with the University of Toronto where certain, I think, uh, benefits were uh, uh, permitted her through tax credits and what have you, um, but she she was very clear that that the, uh, the potential static that would be generated yeah. if uh, Canada awoke one morning to find on the front page of the Mail and Globe that that her papers had gone uh, to the New York Public Library or to the Lilly Library in Indiana or, or, or God forbid to Texas, as did Michael's papers, uh, that that would not be a happy experience for her. Yeah. I had heard. So, and, and I, uh, when younger, not as 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 alert. Um, I was fortunate enough to spend a couple of long weekends uh, with Robinson Davies up in Canada, who uh, was even more sensitive uh, to this issue, given uh, his his background and his family's history there, than even Margaret was. So, so, so what you're saying doesn't surprise me. And but I don't. Uh, unfortunately, I, I really can't contribute any any light to it. Um, but I think that would be a very interesting question to pose to Mr. Lopez uh, if you were to. Bring them mm -hmm. onto your podcast. Yeah, I just think it's sad that no one seemed to care in Canada. Well, that's the question care. that 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 uh, you, you sort of begs to be asked is is once it was revealed that this transaction had taken place in Michael's papers had, had had gone south of the border and ended up in Texas. I mean, was there any hue and cry amongst the uh, zero you know, the, the zero cultural elite in Canada? Saying, Couldn't yeah, find anything. Yeah, nothing. <laughs> anyway. Um, speaking of Canadians, you bought some FDR papers for $3.3 million and sold them to Conrad Black, hopefully before everything hit the fan for him, for $8 million. That is correct. I bought them in partnership um, with, 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 with a friend of mine, not in the book trade. Okay. Um, so uh, it's, it's oftentimes slightly mischaracterized. But yes, we, we bought it for $3.3 million and we sold it for $8 million. Congratulations. Thank you. But at a bargain with that. <laughs> he got a bargain. I, I always thought so. He thought so, too. Um, unfortunately uh, for, for, for yeah. Conrad, yeah. Um, you know, some, some of the underpinnings of his, his, his empire shortly after that uh, began to, uh, to, 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 uh, to quake. Yeah, that's... Uh, those papers, that, that collection, which were... The does he still have them? No, those, those papers, which were the, uh, the surviving papers of uh, Roosevelt's second uh, principal secretary, a woman named Grace Tully, um, who took over for uh, Missy Lahan when, when uh, she had a stroke and had to leave the White House in 41. She was Missy's lieutenant, uh, and she was at Roosevelt's side throughout the entire Second World War. So close that when the Roosevelt Library was first founded, uh, she was one of the original three trustees of the library. So the material that we had and that we purchased uh, was uh, the most private and intimate of the material that, that she had preserved. She made enormously uh, large and, and now what would be uh, monstrously valuable gifts to the Roosevelt Library in her lifetime. But when problems, uh, Lord Black's problems came to his front door, mm -hmm. uh, those papers ended up at the FDR Library in Hyde Park and are now the property of the American government. Mm -hmm. Yeah, despite all of, all of his problems, uh, you really do have to admire someone who's doing a biography of a man and wants to acquire all these papers. Well, right? that that was really. uh, you know that was uh, and, and in fact the on at least a handful of occasions uh, the papers are footnoted in his biography of Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. But he was a passionate collector. He was a passionate collector. You uh, apparently, according to this is according to someone at the uh, Harry Ransom Center. You understand sometimes that you have to leave something on the table. Well, it, it, it would it would take more time than than 
uh, unfortunately we have available to one another to try to explain uh, my perception of of what the market for archives is. But it's certainly not a, uh, a traditional marketplace where buyers and sellers will, will queue up and, and look to intersect with, with uh, counterparties who, 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 who are uh, sensitive to what their, their, their roles might be. So I've always thought that my job, when tasked with trying to find a buyer for an archive is to identify what makes a particular archive, uh, what, what, what gives a particular archive specific merits, uh, then think, based on my experience and my friendship or relationship with, with people running particular institutions uh, who would be sympathetic to both the figure and the elements of the archive that, that, that I've identified. You've and got an impressive Rolodex, incidentally. I mean, you have to have a really yeah. good Rolodex. That's right. And then, and, then, and then my job becomes really to be fundamentally, it seems to me, a uh, transparent and honest interlocutor between the two parties. Because at any given moment, there could be you know, a single institution for whom an archive would be a logical fit. Mm. Um, so my goal is not to create an abusive environment or an environment where the party who uh, is, is working diligently to put together the, the resources required to acquire an archive feels that, that, uh, that, that, that their interests are being uh, stepped on rather than protected at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 you know, it's a perfectly fair question and it's been asked on a number of occasions by people who I've either uh, represented or wanted to represent about whether I'm really protecting the interests of my client uh, as aggressively or fully as, as I should be. Uh, but I, I don't really see myself as, as an agent as much as, as a facilitator of transactions, and I think that does paint a slightly different uh, picture of it. Yeah, I mean, you've got an incentive to sell. You want to make money. Mm -hmm. So maybe that it's a, would... It's a, it's a useful undertaking, yes. <laughs> But I mean, th that's sometimes you might say if if a if an institution is only willing to pay a certain amount, you're going to push for that because you want to make the sale. Well, that's 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 the rub um, that has on a number of occasions been identified and raised by people who are either representatives or family members of people that I've worked with, which mm -hmm. is, you know, if, 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 if I'm behaving in the manner you described, am I really protecting the interests of the party who, in theory, I represent? Yeah. And, yeah. and that's, that's, you know, that's a delicate and sometimes um, indelicate uh, conversation that, that takes place. And there have been a few instances where I've been turned down or denied the chance to represent the collection because the advisors to you know, the, uh, the, the owner of the asset believe that the relationships I've had with certain institutions are simply too uh, intimate and longstanding for me to be able to objectively mm -hmm. uh, represent their, their client at the same time. I think it's a, not, not a clumsy, but I think it's an uh, imprecise perception of what the dynamic is, but, but you know, one transaction is not enough to teach somebody you know, what is uh, unique about this particular marketplace. Yeah. If we can get back to, uh, to Bob Dylan uh, again, it seems to me that um, this opens up possibly a, a whole new area for you. I mean, not that many musicians are going to win Nobel Prizes. No, I think, I think that's true. And, and, and <clears throat> the archives of musicians if they are going to be of interest, are really very complex because you're dealing with generations of audiovisual material that are not going to be present in any quantity in the archive of a literary figure. You're going to need an institution or an entity that has the capacity to engage in the necessary transformation of this data um, into something that is 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 uh, uh, moved onto platforms that become available to wide audiences. If you know just a little bit about uh, the music business, um, the amount of licenses and rights that are involved so thoroughly trump the uh, world of, of, of text that on the other musical projects that we've worked on, um, we spent 
endless amount of time you know, having to clear rights before we're in a position to uh, to do something with that. Mm-hmm. So uh, you know, when you throw into that, uh, how might you say, the um, well-documented and slightly reckless lifestyle of many musicians of that generation, I'm not sure how many major archives there will be that can compare to that. Uh, yeah. We've been working for some time uh, on a very difficult project, uh, but I hope soon to complete it and satisfying one with uh, David Byrne on his material, and uh, we've been chatting with the people at Johnny Cash's estate for a while. Um, but I think that's really just a handful of, of yeah. sort of um, what I would call defining figures that uh, we would be interested in working with. And there has to be there has to be an archive there at the same time. Yeah, exactly. So, so maybe this Dylan thing has gotten all sorts of musicians scrambling around trying to pull, pull their papers <laughs> we, we, together. We, we have heard from many uh, notable uh, <laughs> musicians. But, but the thing about the Dylan archive, which is worth keeping in mind, is that uh, the paper element was just a part of it. It has an enormous amount of uh, uh, audiovisual yeah, material, yeah. enormous amount of photographic material, a uh, certain type of, of business records that uh, will be, I think, of great interest in subsequent generations. Just winding down, you've been uh, complimented on your the creative way in which you structure um, deals. Uh, uh, I wonder if you could just give us a few examples of some of the more creative what solutions that you've offered to both parties. Well, I don't know that they really... I, I think that's a slightly overblown sentiment in that you know, the book business has historically not been a trade uh, that has lent itself to you know, a lot of commercial gymnastics and the sort of uh, engineering that usually take place in you know, more traditional uh, enterprises where many of the things that we do would be considered second or third nature, you know, just, just have a certain novelty factor. We've, on a number of occasions, worked with institutions and sold them archives where we've arranged uh, for the seller to donate a certain percentage of the uh, funds they've received back to the institution for the processing of it. Um, mm-hmm. We've laced the sellers into, as we did with uh, Woodward and Bernstein, where we contractually arranged that uh, if the deal was done that uh, four times over the next eight years they would host two-day symposiums at the University of Texas, masterminding what those symposiums would be. Hmm. Um, we've been good at figuring out ways to transfer certain licenses and rights to institutions so that they can exploit the the as- asset uh, for digital purposes. But I, do, I don't really think that there's anything that, that, that if you um, called up a couple of the guys at uh, Microsoft or Facebook, they would look at and say, you know, gee, <laughs> what an original you know, way of putting a transaction together. We've also been good at, at helping institutions find funding for, um, for acquisitions and, and structuring them in such a way that uh, the acquisitions aren't necessarily punitive. But as I said, I, I, I do think that the, the compliment or compliments are, are slightly, uh, slightly overblown. Speaking of compliments, uh, among your competitors, who do you admire the most? I don't know that I would use the word competitors. They're, they're, they're you know, a handful of colleagues that I work closely with and, and, and whose approach I admire. I think the, 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 certainly the, the, the closest uh, commercial the relationship I have in the book trade is with a uh, a firm out of London called Peter Harrington Rare Books, and uh, we, we share a substantial amount of, uh, of uh, high-end inventory together. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm generally uh, very fond and admiring of a bookseller I've done for many years in southern New Jersey named Tom Congleton in Between the Covers Rare Books, um, who I uh, find to be you know, a, a font of energy and imagination. I think um, he was head of iLab. For I, th- I think that he was, yes. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've never belonged to the trade organizations. So I've found that carefully. Um, but the, and, and, there, and there are some you know, really very, um, uh, uh, seems to me, uh, bright and dedicated younger booksellers. And I, I hope that there's a book trade for them to, uh, to mature into. Do you think there will be one? <laughs> Do I think? Um, it's, a, it, it's a sour note on which to bring our conversation to conclusion. I'm not sanguine uh, that it will 
uh, survive. Uh, it, certainly, it certainly no longer is the book trade that I entered in 1980. Um, and the number of young consumers uh, who will evolve into collectors and then ultimately into what you know, every bookseller dreams of as a connoisseur, uh, somebody who really is able to articulate a vision for the collections they want to build, seem to me uh, to be diminishing dramatically. And I see fewer and fewer. And, and certainly, you know, mm. if, if, if you subscribe as, uh, as I do to the notion that uh, the, the uh, ubiquitous presence of, of devices and screens has really, to a large extent, shattered people's capacity for concentration, um, it's really not that surprising that uh, that tool, you know, of, that, that mental tool of required to, to read long-form texts is, uh, is evaporating quickly. And if you're not raised uh, reading books and holding books and handling books, then it's going to be very hard to imagine people evolving into collectors of it. New York City, 1980, when mm. I went into the book business, was Upper East Side of New York was West Side was just filled with bookstores. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, it doesn't take more than a 15 to 20 minute stroll around to realize that there are no bookstores left. So without bookstores, it's going to be very difficult to uh, envision generations uh, coming of age. Yeah, I set out about 10 years ago to, to, uh, to, to photograph as many bookstores as I could. I think I'm up at around between six, 7,000 now, but uh, they're harder and harder to find. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Six, 7,000 bookstores you photographed? Yeah. What would be very interesting is to right, the trace... The photographs I've okay, got, yeah. Is to trace you know, how many of those bookstores between the time you photograph them now have, have, mm-hmm. you know, have, have managed to survive and, and understand what they've done to do that. Yeah. Finally, to move things from shadows into light, from dark recesses into public space. That's very articulate. Who said that? <laughs> of course you did. And uh, you called that an exciting, a very exciting way to earn a living. My my greatest love in my career as a bookseller is is generated by, uh, for lack of a more elegant expression, the transmission of texts and how they move from uh, their earliest form in manuscripts to how they enter the world and, and how particular copies of, of central texts then circulate uh, through generations. Uh, it's what's driven me to be incredibly alert and diligent to particular copies of books that have really profound associational um, interest. Um, it's what's committed me to uh, manuscripts and letters and then to archives. So the, the idea of how texts move through generations has really been, for me, probably the strongest impulse that I've had in, in the book business. That comment uh, really referred specifically to what is the dynamic that is set in motion when an archive moves after decades from the hands of a generator or an estate into an institution that then makes it available. But one of the things that got people very excited, for example, about you know, the, the Garcia Marquez archive that we handled was, you know, in this enormous body of work, you know, I mean, what was there to see that would give you some insight into how this incredibly um, uh, profound and and original imagination, you know, conceived of texts in a manner that nobody had thought of before. In Bob Dylan's case, I mean, there's such a a deep sense of uh, Dylan as an inscrutable figure that that Mm. the archive, even the existence of the archive was for many, you know, a mystery. Uh, so that literally is, is what does and take... for you, too. Um, Who would have known, you said, I think. That's right. I, I don't know that uh, I gave a lot of thought to it because it never it dawned on me that you know, at some point I would be you know, beckoned you know, to work on this. But uh, you know, that really is the bridge that's crossed when the archive moves from one side of the river, in a sense, to the other, which is you know, from some form of, of the furtive to you know, another life as a, a, a um, for lack of a better word, I would just call it an open book. You've, you've achieved everything, I think, that if anyone could hope to achieve in this field. What do you want to do with the rest of your life? Um, I would like to continue to identify collections 
that heretofore people have not thought of as having the interest that I'm able to, 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 to show that they can have. I would like to continue searching for particular copies of books that uh, embody those values of, sort of you know, resonate with the values that, that I find appealing um, about, about particular uh, texts. Making the argument then, making the argument for a material that, as you say, previously hadn't really been valued. I think that's well put. And then, and then uh, the last large project I'd like to work on, and I've begun, is to collect what I think of as individual manuscripts and letters of great value that I can bring together as as something maybe of a, you know, a series of crown jewels with the belief that over the next 10 or 15 years the world is going to move if it hasn't already beyond a moment of paper into you know, a, a you know, infinite, infinite variety of of, of, of text, but uh, that doesn't exist in, in material form. So that, that that's what I would like to do. You're not going to write your memoir then? Um, I might take a stab at it, but I don't, I don't know that it would have <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that it would have a wide enough audience to justify it. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much for uh, shedding light yes. on the dark recesses of uh, placing uh, author archives for that us. It's been a great pleasure, and thank you for making the time. I've been speaking with Glenn Horowitz, who is one of the top brokers of cultural archives and rare books in the United States. Thanks again. My pleasure.